Hello, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of the 15-Minute Devotional Program, an online video podcast series for Akron Alliance Fellowship Church in Akron, Ohio, and for listeners to Melvin Gaines's Faith Channel podcast. Thank you so much for being here today. My name is Melvin Gaines. As usual, this program continues to help people to grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, by getting into God's Word and staying in His Word. In this particular program, we're going to be covering the two-year daily Bible plan reading for Wednesday, May the 8th, 2024. That's May 8th, 2024. Our church, Akron Alliance Fellowship, encourages participation in the two-year Bible reading plan, which allows for the reader to cover the entire Bible over a two-year period. In our particular devotional here, which takes about 25 to 30 minutes, uh, our program is going to read the passages for today, and then we're going to make some verbal notes about the content as we go. But when you follow the two-year Bible reading plan, it normally requires a 7 to 10 minute period of time of reading the passages for that day, followed by an additional 5 to 8 minutes of time going over those passages in meditation and prayer. And that's why we refer to this program as the 15-minute devotional, because it takes about 15 minutes of time per day for you to go through the to your Bible daily, to your daily Bible plan reading. We encourage all participants to follow this pattern. If you're not into the Word, if you don't read a lot, follow a pattern of being in the Word, following the two-year Bible reading plan, and it'll get you through the Bible, and it'll do so and help you to be successful in doing so. Of course, you can always read more than 10 minutes a day if you desire to, because you're going to want to do that as long as you continue to grow in the love of the Lord and looking at his word, hearing what he has to say to you, and being prayerful about it. But following this plan, if you don't have a plan already, or if you're looking to get more solidified with your Bible reading, this is a really great way to do it. It's very successful. I've been doing it for about three years now myself, and it has really worked out very well in going through the Bible. And it's great because it also develops what familiarity of the passages that you read. You can get downloadable copies of the two-year Bible reading plan from our website, akronalliance.org, that's all one word, akronalliance.org, by selecting the links tab and then clicking on the tab that says two-year Bible reading plan. So we're going to go ahead and get started with the reading of the passages, but first we do so with a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you that you indeed are, indeed are our completeness. You make us complete because we trust in you and rely upon you. Lord, may we continue to pray and seek you for wisdom and knowledge as we go about our daily affairs, our daily business. And we thank you for going with us wherever we go. Bless this time we spend in your word, Lord, and we give you praise and thanks. In Jesus' precious name, amen. All right, everybody, we're going to now go to our readings for the day. And uh, let me point out what those passages are because I didn't do that, did I? Uh, it's Ecclesiastes 7.1. Uh, through verses chapter 8, verse 8. We have 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 through 10. We have Psalm 48, verses 9 through 14. And then Proverbs 14, verses 30 and 31. So let's turn our Bibles and electronic devices now to Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 1. And we'll take a look at that together. This is going to be a, a passage that... Um, of course, Solomon is the author of Ecclesiastes, and we're going to be covering uh, Solomon's writing here. Is as if uh, when he went through this writing of Ecclesiastes, he is the type of person that I would almost equate to one who is uh, experimentalizing with uh, the different aspects of life and the different ways of looking at those things. He was looking at the matters of nature. He was looking at... Um, philosophy, psychology, all these things were being examined. But in this particular chapter, chapter 7, he's going to be talking about morality. And uh, the heading in my Bible says the contrast of wisdom and folly. So let's go through the passage. We're going to read all the way through to Ecclesiastes uh, 7, 1 through 8, 8. 8 uh, yes, 8, 8. And uh, let's go ahead and follow along in your Bible. Uh, I, we always read from the New Living Translation for clarity, and please follow along in your version. Verse 1, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 1. A good reputation is more valuable than costly perfume. 
And the day you die is better than the day you are born. Better to spend your time at funerals than at parties. After all, everyone dies, so the living should take this to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for sadness has a refining influence on us. A wise person thinks about death, while a fool thinks only about having a good time. Better to be criticized by a wise person than to be praised by a fool. Verse 6, a fool's laughter is quickly gone, like thorns crackling in a fire. This also is meaningless. Extortion turns wise people into fools, and bribes corrupt the heart. Finishing is better than starting. Patience is better than pride. Control your temper, for anger labels you a fool. Verse 10, don't long for the good old days. This is not wise. Wisdom is even better when you have money. Both are a benefit as you go through life. Wisdom and money can, can get you almost anything, but only wisdom can save your life. Accept the way God does things, for who can straighten what he has made crooked? Verse 14, enjoy prosperity while you can, but when hard times strike, realize that both come from God. Remember that nothing is certain in this life. I have seen everything in this meaningless life, including the death of good young people and the long life of wicked people. So don't be too good or too wise. Why destroy yourself? On the other hand, don't be too wicked either. Don't be a fool. Why die before your time? Verse 18, pay attention to these instructions for anyone who fears God will avoid both extremes. One wise person is stronger than 10 leading citizens of a town. Not a single person on earth is always good and never sins. Don't eavesdrop on others. You may hear your servant curse you. Verse 22, for you know how often you yourself have cursed others. I have always tried my best to let wisdom guide my thoughts and, my, my, and actions, I said to myself. I am determined to be wise, but it didn't work. Wisdom is always distant and difficult to find. I searched everywhere, determined to find wisdom and to understand the reason for things. I was determined to prove to myself that wickedness is stupid and that foolishness is madness. I discovered that a seductive woman is a trap more bitter than death. Her passion is a snare and her soft hands are, are chains. Those who are pleasing to God will escape her, but sinners will be caught in her snare. This is my conclusion, says the teacher. I discovered this after looking at the matter from every possible angle. Though I have searched repeatedly, I have not found what I was looking for. Only one out of a thousand men is virtuous, not but not one woman. <laughs> but I did find this. God created people to be virtuous, but they have each turned to follow their own downward path. Okay, let's go to chapter 8, verse 1. Reading through to verse, 10, verse 8, excuse me. Verse 1, Ecclesiastes 8. How wonderful to be wise, to analyze and interpret things. Wisdom lights up a person's face, softening its harshness. Obey the king since you vowed to God that you would. Don't try to avoid doing your duty. And don't stand with those who plot evil, for the king can do whatever he wants. His command is backed by great power. No one can resist or question it. Those who obey him will not be punished. Those who are wise will find a time and a way to do what is right. For there is a time and a way for everything, even when a person is in trouble. Verse 7, indeed, how can people avoid what they don't know is going to happen? None of us can hold back our spirit from departing. None of us has the power to prevent the day of our death. There is no escaping that obligation, that dark battle. And in the face of death, wickedness will certainly not rescue the wicked. Okay, that's Ecclesiastes 7, uh, chapter 1, chapter 7, verse 1 to chapter 8, verse 8. And you can see that Solomon, uh, who was a king himself and the, the richest king that ever lived by all accounts, um, he is writing this based upon the fact that he is looking at life and uh, he's writing with a great deal of uh, cynicism. He's writing with a great deal of um, skepticism. He's uh, learning things over time and he's looking about looking at very important subjects, frankly, when it comes to our human existence. What's what's the most important thing for us to do is we are, are we are to we're to live 
not amongst ourselves. We're to live in such a manner where we are being wise and we're not being foolish. We are to live in such a manner where we're, frankly, being, um, if you go to chapter 8, uh, he's giving an interpretation about how people need to understand the importance of uh, falling under leadership and making sure that you're doing those things that you should be doing. <clears throat> the equivalence, uh, not to bypass chapter 7, but looking at chapter 8, the equivalence here is about looking at Jesus Christ, who is the king that we, we respond to and we're supposed to pay attention to. And that's Jesus Christ. And I like what it says in uh, chapter 8, verse 2, Obey the king since you vowed to God that you would. The king here, for our purposes, is... Of course, Solomon could be referring to himself, but he's referring to anybody who's in headship. <clears throat> Kings make decisions, and there's no one that can resist the power, no one that can uh, counter what is being said. It's whatever the king says goes. And Jesus Christ and his word are what we need to be paying attention to. And that goes back to the concept of being wise versus being foolish. Wisdom and knowledge are what we always seek God for, right? We're always looking to him to make sure that we are always doing what is smart, what is doing doing things that are wise, and resisting those things that can drag us down, cause us to sin, and run into this place called foolishness. <clears throat> and I like how he mentions in chapter seven, uh, it's better to be uh, it's better to be wise, and, and certainly we recognize that because of God's sovereignty, uh, wisdom and knowledge may or may not have anything to do with how long you live, but he did mention the fact that being foolish would be uh, the wrong thing, to, wrong way to go because you could cut your life short. So a lot of comments that Solomon making her are 1,000% true. I mean, they're, he's telling the truth here. At the end of the day, we recognize, though, that it's always better to be on the side of wisdom and knowledge. And it's not so good to stay in a foolish area. And you're not going to uh, have to face any condemnation if you're being if you're following Christ he is the one we need to be paying attention to in verse 5 of 8 uh, Ecclesiastes 8 though who those who obey him will not be punished those who are wise will find a time and a way to do what is right for there is a time and way for everything even when a person is in trouble and it's a big amen right life dictates to us often what what is good and what is troublesome and even in spite of all of that and all the things that we do and where we go what we go about our business doing or where we are, we always want to be on the side of righteousness, recognizing Christ and doing what we need to do. And he's gracious enough to respond to us in such a manner too, where we may even accomplish more during the course of a day than we had set out to do because he lays the plans out before us. We don't always see everything, but because we are trusting in him, he provides for us and gives us what we need. So I, I, I hesitate staying cynical. I know what Solomon's trying to tell us here in this passage, but I also recognize that he's giving us realities too, uh, everyone. Life is what it is. We deal with things as they come. But at the end of the day, we want to trust in him, trust in Jesus Christ, and allow him to work through our lives. And we always give him the praise and thanks for his wisdom. He knows everything. He knows all about us. He knows where we are at this time in our lives. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. I just thank God for his wisdom. I thank him for the inspiration. And I thank him for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who reveals things to us as we go about what we're doing. He reveals things. He speaks to us. He is always in communication with us. We have to be better listeners to the Spirit, frankly. And I think that's the challenge that we all have. And just want to encourage everyone here online as well, too, as we, as we go through these things. Prayer is so important in this process. Prayer is supposed to be ongoing all day long at, at all times. There's no time when you should be saying, well, shouldn't pray now. No, that's never the case, right? You should always be in prayer. And that's really, really important for us to see here. 2 Corinthians 7, chapter 8, uh, check 2 Corinthians 7, verse 8 through 10. Sorry about that. I'm, my mind is uh, all over the place, trying not to be that way. I'm going to try to focus here. This particular section, we're only covering three verses in this chapter. And this has to do with Paul. <clears throat> He's actually communicating with or speaking to a person in the church who had had a pretty bad, uh, pretty grievous sin where he was, uh, it was an incestuous sin where he was sleeping with a mother-in-law and it was condemned as it should have been. And 
you're going to see the account that Paul gives about this when he's writing back. Uh, this is within his letter to the Corinthian church, 2 Corinthians 7. Let's read verse 8. I am not sorry that I sent that severe letter to you, though I was sorry at first, for I know it was painful to you for a little while. Verse 9, now I am glad I sent it, not because it hurt you, but because the pain caused you to repent and change your ways. It was the kind of sorrow God wants his people to have, so you were not harmed by us in any way. Verse 10, for the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow. But worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. Okay, that's the reading for today, 2 Corinthians 7, verses 8 through 10. And this is a very personal uh, communication that's taking place within the church. But I love how the Spirit wants to reveal this to us. What is the Spirit trying to tell us? First of all, you need to, if you do something wrong, or if you do something that is not right, you need to repent of it. And if you are corrected or being given correction by someone uh, over this issue, you need to suck it up and deal with it and take it like a person should, take it like a man should, or take it like a woman should. You need to recognize that uh, all of us have to be accountable to each other when we're in a, a fellowship, in a body of Christ, within a church. And there are way too many times during churches or church settings where People who do something wrong, I mean, people are well aware of it and they don't make any correction. Absolutely should never happen. It should be always, there should always be the proper correction being given whenever something happens like that. But what are the parameters behind that? You do so out of love. You be truthful about it. You tell people the truth. You don't sugarcoat it. You tell them what they did was wrong. You tell them what they did was a grievous sin. It was a sin that um, hurts the body, hurts you, hurts everyone involved. And and then you notice how Paul mentions about the importance of essentially what we're calling godly sorrow versus worldly sorrow. That's what is referred to in verse 9 here. Uh, the kind of sorrow that God wants people to have so you are not harmed by us in any way. It caused you to repent, caused you to change your ways because true godly sorrow means you're, you're going to repent. You're going to turn from your sin. You're going to denounce what you did. You're going to say it was wrong, and you don't need to dwell on that. You just need to dwell on the fact that the most important thing is that I need to follow my Lord and Savior. I need to follow what he teaches. I need to follow his instruction. And it's not about going and staying in the past over it. It's done. It's over with. You repent. God forgives you, and you move on. Godly sorrow. You really are sorry about what happened. Worldly sorrow is an unrepentant sorrow. Worldly sorrow is where... You know, it's like, I'm sorry I got caught. That type of an attitude, which is not anything that any believer should have. Um, and that's why even Paul says it, worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. Spiritual death means separation from the, from the Lord Jesus Christ and the Father forever. You don't want that. That's not what anybody really wants. We have a lot of people who operate in the world today in under the premise of being worldly, uh, with worldly sorrow. Um, and you see way too much of it, of examples of that, uh, where people just, uh, you know, they don't, they're not sorry. They're, they're either mouthy, they, they want to talk and try to uh, not allow anyone to say anything to them or give correction. And you see this so often, you, you'll, you kind of see it from a mile away if you're used to uh, being in an environment like that. May we as believers always live with the understanding that worldly sorrow is not anything we had, should have anything to do with. We need to be always sorry. We Look, all have sinned and fall short of God's glory, right? The wages of sin is death, but God gives us a gift, eternal life through Jesus Christ. That was Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, paraphrasing very quickly, but just giving you the understanding of that's where we need to be camping out. That's where we as believers need to be. We need to always have godly sorrow Always be ready to repent. Always be ready to confess our sin. Always be ready to ask the Lord for forgiveness. And at the end of the day, God is going to respond to you because he sees your heart and he sees where you are. Always operate and understand now that you, if you have a heart for God, you're going to always be sorry when you commit sin. 
And Paul is gracious enough to give us information to help us in this area if we need to. If we need to give correction to somebody else, we know how to go about it. But we do it with love, don't we? We do it not with harshness. The f Sometimes the truth is harsh. Sometimes facts are harsh. But they are what they are. And we need to recognize that and acknowledge it and deal with it and say, Lord, you're right. Lord, I sinned. Lord, I need to repent. And thank you, Lord, for showing us how to go about it the right way and for us to help others as well, too, in that matter. Let's go to Psalm 48. Psalm 48, and we're going to look at verses 9 through 14. Psalm 48, verses 9 through 14. And God is so good. He just really helps us with great information here. Now, this is uh, another uh, psalm. You know, I, I didn't mention it earlier, but Ecclesiastes is almost written like the Proverbs because of the way uh, the information is given. And the psalms are the psalms, and, and they are certainly songs, and they give praise. But this is about a celebration. Uh, this last section or part, this last portion or part of the last portion here in Psalm 48 is talking about the goodness of God. Verse 9, Psalm 48. O oh God, we meditate on your unfailing love as we worship in your temple. As your name deserves, O oh God, you will be praised to the ends of the earth. Your strong right hand is filled with victory. Verse 11. Let the people on Mount Zion rejoice. Let all the towns of Judah be glad because of your justice. Go inspect the city of Jerusalem. Walk around and count the many towers. Take note of the fortified walls and tour all the citadels that you may describe them to future generations. For that is what God is like. He is our God forever and ever, and he will guide us until we die. What a beautiful, um, what beautiful poetry here. And it's just giving mention, and it's referring to the God that we worship. And we worship the Lord, obviously, when we go to church on Sundays. It's referring to temple here, but we also give praise all over the place. We give worship and praise and honor to him everywhere we go, not just at church. Amen. It's everywhere we go. And of course, we know that the focal point here is in Jerusalem. The focal point is on in the place where Jesus set foot. And we recognize that Jerusalem is going to be the place where the focus remains. Uh, Israel is going to be the focus and the, the new Jerusalem is going to be the city. That's going to take place in the uh, in that period of time when Jesus has returned and he and he uh, uh, will eventually be king, of course. And but we recognize that it's this is really just a section here of the psalm where it's just giving praise to God, praise for who He is, what He did for us, uh, what is to come for us for those who believe in Him. He is worthy of our praise. And I like verse 14. For that is what God is like. He is our God forever and ever, and he will guide us until we die. Well, we have an earthly life where we're going to die, but we're going to, we have an eternal life with him after that, where we will always be with him. So um, that's something to point out and make sure that we're all aware of and mention. Um, giving praise to God is a, is a good practice to have, to remember what he did for us on the cross and recognize the importance of us truly giving him the praise for what he did. It is it is not a small thing what he did for us. It is something that was life-changing, life-altering, world-altering, the things that Jesus did for us when he came to earth to be our atonement, our eternal sacrifice for all time, past, present, and future, of our, and for the forgiveness of our sin. He's the reason why we have fellowship with him. He's the reason why we have fellowship and we can pray to God in Jesus' name because he is our intercessor. Amen. That is worthy of our praise. All right, let's go to Proverbs 14. And let's uh, finish up verses 30 and 31. Proverbs 14, verses 30 and 31. And of course, as Proverbs always does, there's always this back and forth that takes place about uh, wisdom versus foolishness. Um, and let's read verses 30 and 31. A peaceful heart leads to a healthy body. Jealousy is like cancer in the bones. 
Those who oppress the, the poor insult their maker, but helping the poor honors him. Okay, two things of focus here. Um, I love this peaceful heart. How many of us really practice peace? Peacefulness. Uh, peace is one of the spiritual gifts that we get um, through the Holy Spirit, the, the ability for us to have peace. And at the end of the day, it leads to a healthy body. And we, we know how very often we've equated uh, illnesses with uh, sometimes the illnesses that we have based upon our, our attitudes, our poor health, our, our, our poor attitudes. Those things are, are difficult. Uh, those things are tied very closely to, excuse me, um, how we, um, our actions, our behaviors. Jealousy is like a cancer in the bones. Now, jealousy may not cause cancer, but it certainly, it shows that you're preoccupied with something that you have no business being preoccupied with. Why are you jealous? What about your relationship with Jesus Christ? Don't you have enough in Christ? Verse 31, those who oppress the poor insult their maker, but helping the poor honors him. And Jesus always has said, um, blessed in Matthew chapter five, blessed are the poor in spirit. And we talk about poor, Poor has different definitions, of course. Poor could mean a lack of money. Poor could mean uh, a lack of uh, spiritual uh, goodness as well, too. And yet, if we are there to help others through those situations, whether it be with donations or uh, giving them meals, or that's something that uh, you're giving glory to God in doing so. And those who oppress the poor insult their maker. Insult who? The Lord. We're all created by the same Lord. And we need to treat people the right way. And at the end of the day, those of us who look down, have our noses and look down on other people, um, how is God going to bless that? How is he going to be glorified when you have that type of an attitude? And the answer is he's not. I pray that you always consider um, and think about, think outside of yourselves um, more often than maybe we even do. Not that you don't do it, but Think outside of yourself and re recognize those people around you, maybe within the body of Christ, maybe with people that you know who are less fortunate, poor in spirit, maybe poor in finances, maybe they need a meal or something. Think about them. Give them consideration and pray about what you can do to help them through. Um, you don't do it just to get brownie points with God. You do it because you genuinely love the Lord and you want to be a servant for him. So I think that's my greatest takeaway from that particular passage. A lot to think about here, but let's go ahead and pray and close out. Father, thank you again for your presence today, and thank you for the teaching that only comes from you through the Spirit. Lord, I thank you for the, the way that we can take your readings and just learn so much from them as we just stay after it and do it and continually day after day. Thank you for your presence and your loving kindness, Lord. Thank you for your patience with us, too. Lord, we require, frankly, patience from you because... Uh, we know that there are many times we just don't get it right away. Sometimes we just need to have to go through things and have you teach us. And we thank you, though, for doing all of those things. Bless this time, Lord, and we look forward to getting back together with you in the word again very soon. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Thanks for joining me for today's 15-minute devotional. It was a great devotional today. God bless you and take care of yourselves. We appreciate you being here, and we'll see you around the corner. And we'll see you next time.